having people buy stocks because they've fallen from price X to two-thirds of X or half of X. On that basis alone, they're buying a stock. That's called bottom fishing the stock market. Very, very difficult. I've had a rough go with it. Peter Lynch is here. He is a legendary investor. He is a best-selling author. He is a philanthropist. For 13 years, he ran Fidelity's Magellan Fund with average annual returns of nearly 30%. From 1977 to 1990, it grew from $18 million in assets to $14 billion in assets. He retired at the age of 46. Since then, he's dedicated his time and his resources to giving away a large portion of his personal fortune. I'm pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome. Hey, now, see, I've been wanting, I've been, you know, we had this wonderful interview. And I, say, I would occasionally say, whatever happened to Peter Lynch? You know, it's one of those things. Uh, because and whatever happened to Peter Lynch right. is my question. Well, it's funny. People said he'll start his own fund. He'll do a hedge fund. I said, no. Yeah. I know they've had enough of it. Because yeah. I, he wants to do it all on his own. Well, he doesn't I, need I, the great fidelity, you know, as a Well, I have cover. a very small transmission as one gear overdrive. And that's it. <laughs> yes, so I you do. can't sort of run a fund. And I had yeah. lovely wife, Carolyn, three children. Right, right. I want to do other things, so I now work very part-time with younger analysts. Yeah. So it's been a, my father died at 46. So yeah. I, and was 46. that the reason, 46? Or that was gets you 60 mighty. He took sick when he was 43, died at 46. I, maybe, maybe I was going to live to 146, but I said, I love the job, love the company, but I'm, I'm, I worked every Saturday for 11 years. Yeah. I just want to spend more time with my wife and family. And you're constantly on the road because that, you oh, believed in you got it. being there. In fact, you would take her with you. Yes, that's uh, right. And family with you because, yes. yep. you know, in search of understanding the company. Correct. That's right. Yeah, and, and and so what have you learned since then? I mean, do you look back and say, oh, I, I stopped too early. B, I stopped too late. <laughs> no, I, I, it's lucky. It was a perfect time. It was an absolutely perfect time to yeah. be able to see all my three children grow up, and now they're all married. I'm spend time with my grandchildren. You know, it's, 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 it's yeah. fabulous. Tell me about your passions. Well, I think my wife and I, Carolyn, we, her father was a high school principal, her yeah. principal. She grew up in rural Delaware. Yeah. I went to public schools, and we, we have the best college and universities in the world. No one would d doubt that. Right. But K through 12, we're not yes. that hot. No. And somebody born in America today is less likely to graduate from, from high school than their parents. That's remarkable. Yeah. That's not true in Europe. And falling behind in yeah. scores on, it, right. on, on math yeah. and science and engineering. And also, 25 years ago, you, if you were a dropout, you could work a lathe, work a press, work a... To injection bowling machine. There were lots of jobs. You didn't even have to speak English. Today, it's test equipment, assembly equipment. There's low level jobs at fast food restaurants and at hospitals, but if you want to get a decent job that's challenging and fun, you have to be able to use a computer. You have to be able to speak in English. All these manuals are all in, they're not in Creole, they're not in Portuguese, they're not in all these, you know, Spanish, they're in English. So you, you, today, being a dropout is a, is a tragedy, and it shouldn't be happening. And, and once you lose a step, then you lose the second step and third step and the fourth step so that... And literacy, I, I, there's an amazing correlation. I think of the couple million people in prison, like 85% of them are illiterate. It's not their fault. Here's the thing for me. The people, you, and so many people I know, uh, some deceased, some in youth, some, but all passionate about education. Right. Passionate. Right. All have resources. Right. All have a voice. Right. Why aren't we fixing this? Well, I think, first of all, one of the greatest issue is recognizing the problem. I don't think this problem was clear 10, 20 years ago. I mean, I think when, I think when World War II started, yeah. our army was smaller than the Netherlands. I mean, we didn't yeah. realize how bad Hitler was, how terrible the Nazi party was. We have to recognize the problem. I think we're getting to the phase now we say, there's 45 million kids in public school, probably... Half of them, two thirds, get a decent education. The rest again, not so good education. That is a huge. It's an awful. Not only a problem, it's a tragedy. So I think recognizing the problem and, and people like yourselves are leaders in that. Just getting the word off. This is not acceptable. This right. is bad for everybody. That's the first part. That's starting to happen now. And now there's several things that are happening now to make it better. And I think that's that's very positive. And but do you are you convinced that we have the will to do what's necessary? The will. Well, I think. If, if more people recognize the problem and say, and then, then, then they say we can do something about it, then things will happen. I think we're, we're between phases one and phase two. Some examples like Teach for America, I mean, there's many examples like you know, national mentoring. There are programs that are starting to make a difference. You can really see they make, and people recognize it. That really works. 
And people want to invest, like in the stock market, they want to invest in the companies doing well, not the companies doing badly. Yeah. So if they say, this is a waste, why should I invest it? It's hopeless. You have to take away that hopeless and say, we can, th we can make this a lot better. And, it's, and there's examples in, in, in Massachusetts, we have these charter schools and, and we have some district schools, right. so the public schools. They're now top in the state against mm -hmm. some of the suburban schools. So these things work. They but, really but work. They do, but not all the results of all charter schools is as good well, some as of the you early, might expect. You're, you're exactly right. But some of the early ones weren't well planned. They weren't right. th well thought out. But the ones now, plus some district schools. We're not just, we're talking public schools. Yeah. This is a program called the Achievement Network that does a testing program. It's now in 300,000 students uh, have it today. This should spread all over the country. Mm -hmm. It's something Carolyn did all the research on my wife. And yeah, right. It's a great thing. They basically test the child four times a year, a quick test. And instead of at the end of the year saying this student is falling behind or the class is falling behind, they say the reason Johnny's not doing well, he can't add a quarter to five eighths or, 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 or Susie doesn't understand adverbs. It, it helps the teacher four times a year to find out mm. how to help mm. the student rather than yeah. find at the end of the year, then that goes yeah. to another teacher next year. There are things like that are happening right now and it helps the teacher a lot. And we're just beginning to understand how to use technology too. You know, Correct. for a long time it was there and we didn't, did not right. know how to use it. Right, right. Yep. And then we're, then we're coming on. The Khan Academy is a great example. Exactly, perfect. And then, then, the, then there's the importance of the, of the principle. Yeah. That's something we really focus on. My, because my wife, you know, father's high school principal, imagine the principal spends a lot of time on the boiler or a leaky roof. These are not academics. I mean, it's such an incredible job, and there's yeah. no peers to talk to. I mean, who else do you speak to? It's, it's a lonely, hard job, and it's a difficult job. So we're, walk, we're working to... We started a leadership academy at Boston College right. to work with principals and aspiring principals to help them get the best methods, the best tools. They're the key person in America, mm -hmm. high school principal. Then the teacher's second most important. Yeah. There's, they're the leaders. When you talk CEOs of companies, the Jack Welch's of the world, the Lee I. Coker's, that's a principal. Yeah. That's what they have to do. Uh, take for tangent for a second. Jack Welch, Lee, Lee I. Coker, um, what is it they have? What, you would go around and do a self-analysis of companies, right. and, and you would look for things that you could identify with right. and know that they had the potential to grow, right. Right. and they had a culture right. to grow, and they had right. you know, a plan to grow. What do great managers do? Well, there's, there's two types. You have Fred Smith who comes up with an idea right. called Federal Express. Right. Then he had to grow it, and that's really tricky. Sometimes right. people can just do the idea part. He did all the parts. Right. And then there's Lee Iacocca had to turn around a trouble with Chrysler. And, and even more challenging, a giant company like General Electric to make something good better. I mean, right. that's really hard. So all these people basically were problem solvers. And they, and they had to manage people. And one of the things that surprised people, they don't even really understand the definition of management. It's getting things done through others. It's a lot easier to do something yourself. Yeah. You have somebody else do it. And lots of people. And obviously, you're managing people. And sometimes you have to encourage them. Sometimes you have to... This Push them a little higher. I mean, right. all Inspire, people are different. It's hard. Encourage. But you have to understand what they want. You have to work with them. You have to explain yeah. yourself. You have to set goals. And you have to be a leader yourself, and you have to put a lot of effort yeah. into it. And you have to be, make, say you make mistakes. And there's a, there's a real amazing difference between being persistent and being stubborn. And I think great leaders could say, this is Persistence it. Persistence is good. Stubborn is bad. Persistence is terrific. Stubborn yeah. is terrible. But, but do great managers listen? Yes, they do. Absolutely. Yeah. Categorically. I've come to know and believe that listening is a principal, oh. essential yep. quality. And sometimes uh, managers get so high up, the people around them aren't giving them ideas. Know, they're exactly. just yeah. chill and filtering everything else. Yeah. They, they don't have a chance to listen. And, and the best managers will make sure they do hear yeah, and, and the they, best thing. And they, and they go out on their own, do their own research, independent yeah. of the people around them. Yeah. Now, you still, back to you, you, you are still with the fund. I mean, you, the, you are the manager of the fund. You run the fund. She runs the foundation. You run the fund, right? Right. I manage the money, but she, makes, she finds all the great ideas. Oh, does she really? She, so so the division America. of labor is that, is that you make the money and she gives it away? That's right. She actually, <laughs> she found Teach for America. Wendy Kopp was like 21 when she found yeah. Teach for America. Right. City year early. National mentoring partnerships. I mean, she, she's the one that's finding, we get lots of proposals. She narrows it down. And she does with other people, site visits. I, I, mean, I attend some of these meetings. I mean, we have board meetings, but I'm basically run, I'm on the investment committee. Yeah. Do you miss anything? Do you miss about the life that you had? Or do you simply say, I have a portion of it. I'm making right, investments right, right, for right, something that right. means a lot to me, yep. and I know where the fruits of my labor are going. Yep. They're going to improve education right, right. and other projects I believe in. Well, the nice thing, I'm, I'm actually running money for our, for, for our foundation. And for ourselves, so right. I'm actually doing the Family same process. Family fund and foundation fund. But I, 
all I have to say, my wife is my only boss. Yeah. <laughs> when I was running Magellan, one out of every hundred Americans was in the fund. Yeah. These are people that five thousand dollars and ten thousand dollars was a huge deal to. So when the market went down, you felt really badly. I mean, you, it's really the, the the pressure on you when it's average people's money. Yeah. That's overwhelming. And you, you're nice enough to say nice things about Magellan, but in those thirteen years, ten times it declined over ten percent. You yeah. know. And yeah, but your point was that, that you were confident enough to say, you know, when it's declining, to know when to give up and when not to give up most right. of the time. Right. I'm saying when the mark went down, I would always go down. So yeah. I, oh, sure, sure, sure. I, yeah. I, but you wouldn't go scared I, I because you'd scored. invest in a company. That's right. I'd just say if the company's fine, it's fine. I mean, basically, Johnson Johnson's higher than it was 40 years ago. Their earnings are higher. Xerox <laughs> is lower than it was 40 years ago. The earnings are lower. So yeah, of course. It's yeah, what but, happens to the company. But you also, did, I mean, I know lots of people who are doing stunningly well right. in, in the world of investments and finance. And they do it by a study of macroeconomics. Right, right. You never bought into that. I, I always joke, I was bottom down. I mean, I, <laughs> and when, I was lucky. I mean, I, I owned a lot of, mo I own American Motor Inns, Hospitality right, Inns, right, right. United Inns. Right, right. And, they all, and I said, who's your best competitor? And they said, La Quinta Motorins. Oh, I remember this, yes. And it was, I, I owned it before sunset. I mean, if somebody ever says something nice about a competitor, you know, it's true. They always yeah. dump on their competitors. Yeah. And if then you I, get them to say what they worry about, somebody's yeah. doing it maybe better they, than I am. They have a better form. We can't match the formula. Yeah. So I, I basically then visited and I made it a big position in Magellan. It was a huge success. Yeah. How long did you stay with it? Look. I think seven or eight years. Yeah. Long. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Great, great success. How do you know when to get out? Well, in baseball analogy, and I know you're a baseball fan, yeah. you want to get in in this first, second, third inning, not when they're drawing up the lineup. <laughs> yes. And Walmart, you could have bought Walmart. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You don't want to do it when they're drawing up the lineup. You that, want to make it to the second, third inning. You when, want to at they, least have seen them at bat. They've got it right. They've got the formula right. And now it's, it's, it toys the rest on 20 stores on the way to 500, or Home yeah. Depot on 40 stores on the way to 4,000. You could have bought Walmart 10 years after it went public, then it went up 50-fold. It's already up tenfold. That's 500-fold. Yeah. Ten years after the Republic, they're only in 18% of the United States. They went to 19, 20. So you can say to yourself, there's a lot of room to go. But when you're in every state, when Limited got to every single mall in the United States, yeah. with Express and Limited, you say to yourself, they're in the 8th or ninth inning. Where can they go? Yeah. So that's how you define it. With a cyclical, when uh, it goes from crummy to semi-crummy, you're happy. Yeah. Then when it goes to good, you're happy. Then it goes to very good, you say, maybe I ought to yeah. go on to something else. So can you be greedy in your business? Yeah, I think sometimes you, you, you I, I call it the three C's. It's called complacency, concern, and capitulation. Yeah. So you get complacent. Is the, is the, I don't call it greedy. You just everything's going right. You sort of forget to check the facts. You say things are starting to slip in the coming. Not the fundamentals, are, they're starting to mature. This thing, the is coming along. So being complacent is the worst one. And is that the one that, that happens most often? Yeah, it, well, if, unless you're working hard. If, if you're working hard, you're always checking with competitors, you're checking with right, customers, right, suppliers. Right, right. You're trying to do work to find out, is this company still early? Am I, does, does they have years and years of growth ahead of them. Mm -hmm. Then you stay with it, no matter, even if the stock goes down. There's also this idea of never invest in something you don't really know. You, I mean, yes. that, that was part of it. That's why you went out on the road so much. Right, right. If I don't understand it, I don't want to. Yeah. The, the, the key thing is when the, when the stock goes from 10 to 6, mm -hmm. if you understand what they do and you know they're financially solvent, you're fine. If you don't understand it, you can call the psychic hawk line. But if you, don't, if you don't understand it, you're probably going to do the wrong thing. You know, if you understand exactly what they're doing, it's, it's gone from 10 to 6, you'll buy more. If you're confused to start with, you'll say, well, there must be something wrong there. And then you, you're out. And then yeah. A lot yeah. of times, stocks are going to decline. I mean, some of my best stocks have gone from 18 to 8, then to sometimes to 40, and some have gone from 18 to 0. <laughs> but at least I wasn't adding to it on the way to 0. A lot have gone to 0. So if it's going down, you're not adding to it? I mean, sometimes you are. If the fundamentals are getting better, they're the same. But, yeah. but if they're deteriorating, I'm going to leave. How much do you measure your success in your ability to communicate well? Your See, command of the language and the facility to express ideas in a simple and comprehensible way has always been the reason your book so well, because there was good content there. And secondly, the way you were able to communicate and become a leader in your industry. You asked a question earlier about the ability to listen. Right. I think that's the skill. Because when you're talking to a company, if you ask all these questions, it's like a monologue. You, you, then you say at the end, is it something I've forgotten? Or, Me too. I say or, it you all know, the time. You want, to, you want to have them say, by the way, a year ago when you were looking to see what, what things are going to be like, how has it come out? Yeah. You know, what have been surprises for you? So I'm always listening to what people say. So it's more listening rather than asking and also being nice. When you go to a company, they'll say, last year your capital spending was $125 million. What is it going to be this year? Last year R&D was $73 million. You just don't go say, how are you doing? Yeah. 
you want to be nice, but courteous, but precise. Precise, right? But you want to show you did some homework. Exactly. And also, you yeah. don't want to use the this rubber hose. This is just like interviewing. Don't I'm be mean. You, this is like interviewing. You don't want to be mean too. If the rubber hose worked, I would have used it. You want to be <laughs> no. You want to be kind. Yeah. You write letters to say I, I enjoyed meeting with you. It was a nice interview. Yeah. People, they, they, they don't, they, they can turn off, they, they have all the answers, but they, may, they don't have to be that nice to you. So you, being kind and courteous, I was a Boy Scout, and be prepared. Yeah, yeah be prepared, exactly. Um, I mean, it is, the, it is central to what I believe is, is that you, you ask people things like, did I miss something? You know, what am I not hearing? Yep. You know, Correct. What question have I missed here? What, yeah. what, yep. you know, it's and almost what I think is important. you got to engage the person right. in your own pursuit. Right. Get, make them yep. work for you. No, I remember that very well. One of the first companies, I was a metals analyst. Right. It was a company, Amax. Yeah. The major product was molybdenum. And I went and I said, what's the outlook for molybdenum? I couldn't even pronounce it. When I took chemistry in high school, we didn't get that high no, in the chart. exactly. That, right. So, <laughs> this, so you find out these people want to help you. If you, you go visit them, yeah. even on the phone. Yeah. And I remember calling one company up, and, and the per you get to know a person's personality. Some people are very optimistic. They're very upbeat. Right. Some people are kind right. of very conservative. And his tone just was not... Is optimistic. I found out later. I almost sold my entire position. Some, you get that feeling. Yeah. I, found, I call him a week later. He says, "You know, you were just down." He says, "Yeah, my brother was in a traffic accident about half an hour before you called, and I didn't know whether he was going to make it or not." Yeah. I almost sold my entire position because of. But an you action. had another question to ask. Yeah. I, mean, I, I called back and I said, yeah. "Gee, you know." Yeah, I will sometimes call people and say, uh, "Did I do something to?" <laughs> To make you upset or angry, or not in terms of the interview, but just, is there something yep. in terms of the relationship between? Am I missing something here? Yep. Did I do something yep. that yep. pissed you off? Yep. And they, they'll, sometimes they'll say, "Yeah, you know, yep. Yep. you didn't see I was over there waiting to see you, and you didn't you walk yep. right by." Yeah, and a lot of times you kind of interrupting people. They, they answer questions, you just cut them off. You really have to be listen. You, you really have to say that. I, I've heard enough of that, but I'm not going to say interrupt. So yeah. it works well. But you still use those skills. Those are human skills, aren't they? Yeah, they but they're not. They're not taught anywhere. I mean, you sort of have to learn. There's no book on that. I want to do something now I have sort of never done, but I had a friend of mine who I know admires you greatly. Uh, and I said to him, okay, just give me five questions you would like for Peter to answer if you were sitting at the table with him. And in three minutes, he sent them to me. So here they are, you know. What has changed about investing in the market since you left in 1990? What has changed? Well, I think there's a lot of this computer-driven Things you know, where people buy stocks for a second and only for a second. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I think I, I think that's a waste of time. I don't think it, I think it's disruptive. On the positive side, information to the public is so much more available today. When a company releases their numbers and they have a, a call, it's open on the web to everybody. Right. All the information. We used to wait for the mail to come to see what Nike's inventories were like. You know, I mean, I mean <laughs> you find out we get in our, in our library in the first class yeah. mail. So all this information. So the investing for the average person now. It's much clearer. They know the same thing as I do. Yeah. They all, it's, it's, you don't want to invest in a company whose balance sheet is, you know, they got $8 billion in debt and, and you know, they, have no, they have no cash and they're losing money. That's a terrible combination. You, you get all the information now. So information is a lot better than it was you know, a long time ago. You still believe in the investment mantra that you were often credited as, as your mantra, which is invest in what you know. Yeah, I'm amazed if somebody, imagine you spent, the, you, you, you've a long time in your field, yes. in my field. Imagine if you're in a mall the last 30 years. <laughs> yes. You, you would have seen The Gap. You would have seen Best Buy. You would have yeah. seen exactly. Circuit City. You would have seen these companies that are crowded doing something better. And, and they're buying biotechnology stocks or oil companies. It makes no sense to me. <laughs> if you're in the steel industry, you see yeah. it go from awful to better. Yeah. Why don't you buy a steel stock? Yeah, but stock? we expect mutual funds to know that stuff. No, obviously. Well, I mean, you, but, you, if you're managing. But they're ahead I mean, of us. You know, if you they're, look at Magellan or you look at. at right. uh, at BlackRock, you, you think they must have access to the best information in the world, but but they don't they don't have that. Inf they're not in the steel industry. They don't see things get better. You know, the way, the way they, they don't see the chemical industry turning as soon as the people in the chemical industry do. I mean, you could be in the plastics fields or lithium, whatever it is. People in the business see it first, and that they see it first. Or, or they're but, in but a mall. Go ahead. In a mall, imagine the companies you've seen the uh, Dunkin' Donuts. It goes on and on. Walmart, you know, Stop and Shop. These are all companies that really get better. So I said, gee, I'm shopping there. But I'm not saying people should, should if they want to invest, they ought to do the same kind of research they do when they buy a refrigerator. Right, they right. they t take your trip to Italy, do but some homework. You know, what the, you know what is about this country that is stunning to me? For the most part, we don't do that about medicine and our health. <laughs> we don't do it. We are more interested in getting the best television <laughs> than we are the best medical <laughs> medical. Yeah. 
No, I, I agree. I mean, the diagnostics, talk about improvements. Yeah. The diagnostics today are so much better. All right. The other thing is what advice we give to young investors who almost certainly will have more direct responsibility for their retirement savings than their predecessors, yeah. of which I'm going to talk about later. Well, I think the, the advantage of putting money into a retirement fund, you know, obviously a Fidelity fund I would prefer, but yeah. index fund, whatever it is, <laughs> put some money aside. It's going to compound tax-free. Yeah. You start saving earlier. The numbers are amazing. Compounding will do good wonders for you, won't it? But, in, but until you want to invest directly in individual stocks, start a paper portfolio. Say, I'm going to buy these 10 companies. And then write down in like five bullets why. What's mm -hmm. the reason I bought those? And then keep checking a year later. What happened? Did, did they really keep growing or did a competitor come along? Do a paper portfolio. And you can do exactly what I did with a real portfolio and find out what am I good at? What am I bad at? Am I really good at turnarounds? Am I good at small growth companies? Maybe I pay it too high for stocks. You can do this very. You can do this over four or five years and learn what's your skills, and then specialize that. I had owned thousands of companies. You know, the average person, all you need is a few in your lifetime. Yeah. Make a difference. Um, we, when you were running fourteen billion dollars, oh, right? Did you see in your mind's eye, uh, and then let's assume a lot of it was pension fund money and whatever. But did you see individuals? I'm investing for. The fireman down the street. Yeah. Did you? It was almost. Or was it a game? It was almost. Almost none of it was pension fund. It was almost all individuals. Speaking. Right. It was. It was incredible that thrill. Yeah. I got letters to when the market went down in '87, my, my fund went down like a rock. Yeah. People were writing letters to me cheering me up. Oh really? Yeah. Oh yeah. No complaints. <laughs> Mr. Lynch, you've done well for me. Yeah. No. Just just hang in there. We're no, hang in there, boy. We'll be okay. You know, <laughs> no, it's amazing. Don't. No, don't give up now, Peter. No. no it was. And I meet these people all the time, all at airports, yeah, all around. And they, they're still. It, it was wonderful. It was the greatest thrill of my life. Other, our, our children and my wife, uh, managing mm -hmm. money for other people. Now we've also seen, um, sort of today, the. You know, the whole business of hedge funds and private equity and shadow sure. stuff. Um, and now they're talking about getting into the mutual fund business. You think that's... Yeah. What do well, you think I, of that? I, I, I mean, hedge I, funds I, getting well, I, into I, mutual funds. Well, a couple of differences, you know, be, between a hedge fund and what I did right. in Michelin. Right. I, was, I could only buy long. I couldn't, right. I couldn't short. So you couldn't sell short. Right. But right. I couldn't and buy hedge commodities. funds can't sell short. Obviously. Right. I couldn't buy commodities. I couldn't buy... I couldn't short the, the euro. I mean, they're into a lot... And they do it on leverage, a lot right. of leverage. So you have to be careful what you get into. There are some hedge funds that are very conservative. They're only going to be 20% short, mostly long. And they, because the nice thing about occasionally, if you have an idea, if I found an idea that I thought was overpriced, I just went on to the next thing. I couldn't short it. So yeah. there, there is an advantage to be able to short, but I, I found that long only. Well, is, but with these hedge funds you get into mutual funds, I mean, they'll have to also live up under the rules that mutual funds live under. Yeah, can, I, can, do you think they will be successful? I mean, well, I, I found the long. They're obviously attracting some. The, the hedge funds, funds that have been on the long side have done the best. I mean, they, they may have a little bit by being short, but be, being right on the long side. Because obviously, if you're right, you can make, and that's, I would say, when I ran Magellan, I might have been right six times out of ten. But if I'm right, I make a double or triple occasionally. It offsets the times you lose 30 or 40 percent. In yeah. fact, you could be right a third of the time as long as you have a lot of good re results. So that's, when, when you're short, you can only make 90 percent. When you're long, you can make tenfold or fivefold. So... I think long is the way to be. Hmm. Uh, it, 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 optimistic. Optimistic, yeah. yeah. Well, I, care, careful and optimistic. <laughs> That's a Red Sox stand. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like the old man, who's, the person who said, you know, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Then, well, why do you have that crown? He said, I'm not certain about my optimism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Wow. And, and so tomorrow, when you look at the market today, uh, a good time for I, yeah. I, I think I think investors it's a, to be there. I mean, obviously we're seeing new highs. Right. I think the market is fairly priced on what's happening right now. You have to say to yourself: Is five years from now, ten years from now, corporate profits have grown about seven or eight percent a year. That means they double, but mm -hmm. including dividends, about every ten years, quadruple every twenty, go up eightfold every forty. Yeah. You know, it's. A, so I think that's the kind of numbers you're interested. That's better. A ten-year bond today is a little over two percent. So I think the stock market's the best place to be for the next 10, 20, 30 years. The next two years, no idea. I've never known what the next two years are going to bring. What do you want to accomplish in the next year of your life? Well, I, I really like to work with my wife and still find, take some more vacation time. Yeah? And, and so what do you can, do on vacation? Well, we, we like to see something new. This year we went to Turkey and went oh, to... Oh, it's fascinating. It's kind of Istanbul, and, but Cappadoc not just Istanbul. Cappadocia. Oh, oh yeah. Remarkable. And oh, then, it's amazing. amazing. It's, I mean, that's one of the world's great cities now. Oh, and then, then we went to Santorini at the end of it. And it was great sailing trips. That was, yeah. and, and two of our daughters and their husbands went with it. It was a great trip. So I'd like, like to see 
Yeah, I've, I've been to Russia. I've never been to St. Petersburg. You know. Oh, you got to go there. I, I've, been, oh, yeah. I've been to Israel. I love Israel. I'd love to go to Jordan. I mean, there's a place oh. I'd like to go to. See, isn't that great? Yeah. I mean, there's so many places you haven't seen. I mean, yeah. well, you just think about it. How many, how many yeah. places do I have that I haven't seen? I'm going to have this year, I go to North Dakota. So I've been to all 50 states now. I, found, yeah. I went on research trip. You go to, to Fargo? Dakota. Actually, no, I went to mine it and parts. Yeah. Of, I actually looked at it. Hydraulic fracturing. So I'm, I'm You're looking at hydraulic fracturing to well, see. See if it works. I mean, yeah. Does this process really work? It does. It does. It really works. And it'll change America's wow. energy future. Remarkable. Yeah. Remarkable. It's one of the great sort of. Oh, what a breakthrough. My goodness. Imagine, imagine producing all this gas and oil, gas at $2 an MCF where yeah. people in Europe are paying 10 times that price. Yeah, how did you decide it worked? Well, I, I really could see this process. Well, first of all, you talk to somebody, you say, Wild canning, as you know, usually you drill four wells right. and you're lucky you hit on one out of right. four. Right. Th these are all either A plus or B plus wells. You don't ever hit a, a, an F. Yeah. So it's just a question, what cost can you do it at? And, and, the, and you own the land. So it's, you don't, and, and the costs are still going down. They're doing it faster, quicker, less sand, less water. They're just doing a better job. Are they environmental threat threats coming out of it? Well, you know, as you know, the... They're usually about 11,000 feet, and the water table is around 2,000 feet. Right. So if you make a mistake, yeah. it goes down. It doesn't yeah, go up. exactly. So they can make mistakes. Yeah. It's great to see you. Okay. Pleasure. Always enjoy seeing you. Peter Lynch.